The Chester Beatty is a vibrant national cultural institution with holdings of manuscripts, rare books and other treasures from Europe, the Middle East, North Africa and Asia. This material once formed the private library of Sir Alfred Chester Beatty and any introduction to the museum he founded best begins with his own story. In 1962, a quietly spoken, reserved and elderly Chester Beatty gave a rare television interview and spoke of his unique collection. Well, we begin a great many of the, we have some manuscripts of the 8th century written in Italy, and then we have the Korans of the 9th century. We have beautiful biblical manuscripts, which is a superb uh, Italian Bible, about 1400. But who was Chester Beatty? And how did he come to donate his collection in trust to the Irish people? As a boy in New York in the 1880s, the young Alfred Chester Beatty had assembled an impressive stamp collection. His teenage passion for collecting rocks and minerals later bore fruit in a successful mining career. Beatty studied briefly at Princeton and then transferred to the Columbia University School of Mines in New York in 1898. He graduated first in his class from Columbia and began his illustrious career by heading out from New York to the Wild West. He started work at the bottom of the ladder as a labourer hauling slag for 25 cents per hour. But it wasn't long before his knowledge of minerals led to a number of gold finds. Soon Chester Beatty, mining engineer, was in business and much in demand. He married the beautiful Nanette Ricard in 1900, and by the age of 27, he was being mentored by the powerful mining tycoon, John Hayes Hammond. As a result of this relationship, Beatty was placed in charge of the most important mining properties in the state of Colorado. Personal tragedy struck Chester Beatty in 1911, when his beloved wife, Nanette, died of typhoid fever, leaving two small children. Soon after, Beatty was diagnosed as suffering from silicosis, the traditional miner's lung disease. It was a condition he had to manage for the rest of his life. He began to visit London. He became friends with another mining engineer, Herbert Hoover, who had offices there. Hoover was later to become President of the United States in 1928. He brought his two children, Chester Jr. and little Nanette, to London together with his brother, William Gedney. He bought Baroda House in elegant Kensington Palace Gardens, which was to be his main residence for the next 40 years. In 1913, he married again to fellow New Yorker Edith Dunstone, who would go on to be a great collector in her own right, particularly of Impressionist and Post-Impressionist paintings. She and Chester travelled extensively over the next three decades. Beatty offered Baroda House to the Red Cross as a hospital after the outbreak of the Great War in 1914. Around the same time, he visited Egypt for the first time with Edith and the two children, and his eyes were opened there to the wonders of Islamic art. Well, I first went with my wife to Egypt in 1913, and while there I bought some Oriental manuscripts and one or two very fine Korans, and then I had a small library before, and then I began to concentrate on the Oriental, and bought a certain number of Western, and kept all the time adding to the Oriental. Over the years, Beatty spent many winters in Egypt, and there he acquired some of the most historically significant items in his entire collection, including the earliest book of St. Paul's letters in existence, dating from the third century. In 1917, recovering from a severe bout of pneumonia and Spanish influenza, an extended family trip to Japan deepened Beatty's interest in Chinese and Japanese art. 
While there, he bought numerous painted albums and scrolls, snuff bottles and Buddhist works. He always sought the best advice, and he built up a network of agents throughout the world. In the 1930s, Beatty funded the construction of the Chester Beatty Cancer Research Institute. This is now part of the Royal Marsden Hospital in London. He once more allowed Baroda House to be used as a Red Cross hospital when World War II broke out. He acted as an unofficial advisor to Churchill's war cabinet on munitions and weaponry to combat the threatened invasion by the German army. He also worked secretly to ensure that essential supplies reached Britain throughout the war. For his many services to Britain, he was knighted in 1954 and became Sir Alfred Chester Beatty. In the years following the war, Chester Beatty's thoughts turned towards retirement, and he was particularly concerned to make plans for the long-term future of his collection. Increasingly disillusioned with post-war Britain, he began to look towards Ireland. Assured of a warm welcome and the necessary official support, in the summer of 1950, he moved to Dublin, where he built a library for his precious collection. His wife, Edith, died in 1952, and Beatty settled in Ireland permanently, where he continued to collect. And now you have the biggest and finest private collection in the world. I, th I think so. They tell me it's so. It's What's rather for the other people to estimate it. What sort of size is it? Well, <coughs> you're seeing, in the Arabic, the rare text, there are about uh, 2,700. But it isn't the number. It's the fact that these books are extremely rare. He presented his valuable collection of rare oriental weaponry to the military museum at the Curra, County Kildare, in the 1950s. He donated a large collection of valuable paintings to the National Gallery of Ireland, and he was made a freeman of the city of Dublin. In 1957, he was the first person to be made an honorary citizen of Ireland. Well, I've been very, very fond of the country, and uh, I enjoyed my life here so much. I, and then I, I finally decided to build the library, and then I finally decided that when I die, I want to leave it to Ireland. In 1968, Chester Beatty died at the Princess Grace Clinic in Monte Carlo. In accordance with his wishes, he was brought back to be buried in Ireland, where he was the first private citizen ever to be honoured with a state funeral. And so the last tribute to the man who has bestowed so much on Ireland. Now he himself belongs to the nation. The great legacy of this remarkable man, Chester Beatty, is the collection which he entrusted to the Irish people and which now finds a home here at Dublin Castle. There is something very special about a collection that's been assembled by one individual over a lifetime. As you wander through the galleries, there is a thread that carries you through Beatty's 90 years of life his 90 years of collecting. So that the collection as a whole bears the mark of his personality, his character, and his story. <laughs>